So following the German historian Detlef Peukert, the Germans had uh, different possibilities to resist the regime. And on the one hand, he separated between the private and the more public area. And then uh, on the other hand, he described the criticism about the regime partial or more general. And he also explained that people had various levels to act against the regime, starting with non-conformism, refusal, protest, and then the highest level, resistance. And Sophie decided somehow to reach the highest level. And we will learn about this uh, more in a second. Um, general criticism in public, and her answer was resistance. So at least the name of the resistance group Sophie Schell was a member of is also well known outside Germany, the White Rose. Um, and this year it would have been Sophie Schell's 100th birthday. That's a good reason to commemorate her, her and that's why we are here tonight. She fought for freedom of uh, speech on the university campuses, especially in Munich, and her resistance to national socialism and the entire Nazi regime cost her everything. She was murdered in 1943. So today we want not only to learn more about this fascinating character, um, but also to ask for her legacy. And I'd like to hand over to you, Gerhard, to say a few words. Thank you, Melanie, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm pleased that the German Embassy in Canada can host this event today together with the uh, friends of the Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust Studies. Uh, hello, Michael. Uh, Sophie Scholl was a student at Munich University when she was arrested. Uh, I know many of you are students. Owing to the pandemic, some of you have perhaps hardly seen a university from the inside yet. Uh, I hope you will find the opportunity soon to thrive in the atmosphere of a campus. A university is a special place and it's such a central place for democracy. Our president, Frank-Walter Steinmeier, put it this way, being a Democrat always has something to do with courage. Courage is the lifeblood of democracy. That's uh, what he said. The members of the White Rose had the courage to dissent and in the midst of war and dictatorship, they did not give up hope for dignity, for freedom, for justice, and they gave them a voice. Each of you who is doing science needs such an impulse of courage, this urge into the unknown, the curiosity to explain the unexplained, and at the same time, the readiness to question one's own explanation and even to have it refuted if necessary. All this is courage of science. Science committed to truth, truth is a thorn in the side of the simplifiers and populists. And it is unfortunately the bitter experience where the freedom of science is curtailed, the way to the curtailment of other freedoms is not far. Scientists do not have to be politicians, of course, but science must not be indifferent when self-evident facts start to slip, when revaluations of the role of science are attempted, when scientific evidence is even delegitimized. Science is for the courageous. Democracy is for the courageous. So have courage. Sometimes the courage to contradict. Sometimes the courage to listen. Sometimes the courage to be able to live with the opinion of others. The courage to strike a balance. The courage to compromise. And that brings me to the question that I hope you will examine in a little more detail later. What is the courage that your generation needs today? For what goals should it be used? How do you behave on the internet? where the boundary between the sayable and the unsayable is increasingly lost, where a lie counts more than the distinction between a fact and a lie. We must be aware of that this willingness to distinguish between fact and lie is vital for democracy. If we give that up, democracy will have a hard time to survive. The good thing is the members of the White Rose paid for the courage with their lives. In a democracy, the braves don't no longer have to be martyrs. The impulse we should follow is touchingly formulated in the fifth leaflet of the White Rose, written, copied, and distributed at the end of January 1943, only three weeks before Hans and Sophie Scholl were arrested in the stairwell uh, of the University of Munich and exited, executed only four days later. This fifth leaflet, addressed to all Germans, as uh, they wrote, says, tear the cloak of indifference that you have wrapped around your heart. Today, we live, work, and discuss under entirely different conditions, but one message remains. Democracy does not tolerate indifference. The fact that you are participating here today is proof for me that you care not only about your personal future, but also about the future of our societies, that you care about both. Thank you. Thank you, Gerhard. Michael, would you like to say some words? 
Sure, thank you very much, Melanie Gerhardt. Thank you for uh, for those remarks, uh, Dr. Gottschalk. Thank you for uh, being here as part of this presentation today. Um, it's really uh, always a special opportunity when we at the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center uh, get a chance to work with embassies or consul general um, on this kind of programming. Uh, we've had wonderful experiences working with a number of, uh, of embassies and today it's the German embassy. And I just, I wanna thank the German embassy in Ottawa, Gerhard and everybody there for partnering with us on this important and meaningful event. Sophie Scholl was a university student, not like many of you joining, uh, not unlike many of you joining us here today. She believed in education, knowledge, and compassion. This, this led her to be part of the White Rose, an anti-Nazi resistance movement in Germany. While she paid the ultimate price for her resistance activities, her legacy is an important reminder to us all. And I think as Gerhard has so um, explained uh, so effectively, um, we need to be vigilant in, to fight against all forms of racism and discrimination and to speak out against anti-Semitism wherever it rears its ugly head. This is ever more true today with the rise of misinformation coming at us from all sides. I think we're all familiar with the new forms of hate that are bombarding us through social media, online, all over the place. But we must have the courage to speak up, push back, and make sure that our voices are, head, are heard. We can never be silent. That's, Sophie Scholl's, that's what Sophie Scholl taught us. That's her legacy how to stand up for what's right in the face of overwhelming obstacles. I'm so looking forward to this afternoon's lecture and discussion and to learning more alongside you all. We all have our part to play. And as Melanie said at the end, there's gonna be an opportunity for questions. And I really hope I see the, the crowd that we have assembled and I recognize many of, uh, many of the names and I know there's always gonna be lots of interest at the end. So please, I encourage you, speak up, ask questions, um, because it's the way we can make this presentation um, even more effective and we can all leave with something. So let's get on with the show. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm about to present, as Melanie mentioned, a short video giving us all a bit more information and history of Sophie Schultz.
Okay, so I think it's my part now. <laughs> Thank you very much um, for the invitation here today. Um, dear Mr. Schlaudraff, dear Mr. Levitt, dear Melanie, dear Frederick, dear Daniela, um, dear audience, I really feel honored that I am allowed to talk to you today about Sophie Scholl a person which is uh, quite close, uh, close to my heart because I, work, I worked uh, several years about her life and wrote this, these two books. And um, yeah, I, uh, I, I gave my short lecture the title, Sophie Scholl, a heroine or saint, who is behind the icon of the resistance. Uh, Sophie Scholl belongs to the most famous women resistance fighters in the Nazi time, not only in Germany, but worldwide. We encounter the famous photos of her again and again in films and books. Uh, her bus is in the Valhalla. She's at Madame Tussauds uh, wax cabinet. Uh, we have films about her biographies. Um, many streets and places are called after Sophie Scholl or Sophie at Hans Scholl, Geschwister Scholl, the siblings Scholl. Um, the commemoration of Sophie Scholl took place this year for her 100th birthday in many places. But do we actually still recognize Sophie Scholl behind this admiration and worship? Does she not seem nearly to be a saint? I would like to bring Sophie Scholl closer to you today because I think only when we understand how she thought, how she ticked, how modern she was, unadjusted, sometimes almost bulky or complicated, only then we can understand what she had done for us also, what she had achieved and where she got the impulse to stand up against the system and how it could come that in front of a yelling judge, she was able to display this incredibly upright attitude and defend her opinion. So I divide my lecture into three questions. How did she become a resistance fighter? What was her role within the White Rose? And where were her resources? Resources, I think. Um, I want to start with a quote from Sophie Scholl from 1942 few months before her death, she writes, all creatures praise the creator. Only man is able to separate himself from this song of praise. And now one could often think that he would manage to row over this song with cannon thunder and cursing and blaspheming. But this has dawned to me on last spring. He can't do it and I will try to side with the victors. So who is this woman who writes such strong sentences at the age of 21? She was born in Feuchtenberg in May 9th, 21. Her father, we learned already, was the major there, an ambitious man who was worked his way up from a small background. Her mother, Lina, also comes from a small background. Both parents want to educate the children to independence and responsibility. The childhood in Feuchtenberg is idyllic, the siblings play in the nature, feel safe, feel loved. But the parents also make demands. Their children should make an effort at school, read a lot, learn an instrument, be prepared to do something meaningful and special with their lives. In 1929, Robert Schaub was voted out as major. So the family moves to Ludwigsburg and then to Ulm. Even before the Nazi came to power in 19. Um, 1933, Ulm was a Nazi stronghold. And while the parents watched the rise of Adolf Hitler with horror, the children inhaled the polluted air of Gleichschaltung at school. Gleichschaltung means all institutions, schools, university, press, law sections are manip uh, manipulated with Nazi ideology. The result is all the Scholz children are members of the Hitler Youth, even though their parents are against it. Sophie Scholl too is a so-called young Mädel in 1934. When she took her oath, she was almost 13 years old. So what was the attraction of the Hitler Youth for her? 
There was the motto, youth leads youth. There were no adults leaders, just young people led young people. Girls found visibility there. They were allowed to take up room. Sophie wanted to take responsibility because that's what she had been brought up to, to take over responsibility. This was the trap for all the siblings, um, Scholl, that the parents had told them, you must do something important, something meaningful. You must take over responsibility for others. Sophie was described as a fanatic, enthusiastic and romantic young mad. She loved amping with campfires, cooking on fire, be outside. She writes in her journal that the trips mean so much to her and she can't get enough of them. Therefore, the question arises, what did she finally take against the Nazis? How did the Hitler Youth Girl become the resistance fighter? There was no moment of reversal. I, uh, it did not change from approval to rejection directly. It was a process and one to which she says nothing in her letters and diaries. The only statement about it comes in the interrogation. She said that she had distanced, distanced herself from the Hitler youth and that her heart was no longer in it. She doesn't explain much about this. So we have to follow her life and look for the moments and the aspects how she turned away. Her nephew, Thomas Hartnagel recently said something very beautifully. He said, Sophie has changed through reflection. She developed her own values and compared them with the values of the Nazis. She always read a lot, including French and English literature, which was forbidden under the Nazis. In November 37, her siblings were arrested, Inge, Werner, and then Hans. The charge was Bündische Umtriebe, the siblings had used the uh, songbooks of a band youth group. Later, Sophie says that she considered this action against us, as she said, as uh, completely unjust. So a few months later, Sophie, her sister Elizabeth and her friend Susanne are deposed as group leaders. Another aspect is puberty. She prefers to go dancing flirting, partying. She fell in love with Fritz Hartnagel when she was 16. He was four years older. And also this relationship ensures that the service in the Hitler Youth is not longer so important. So when the war begins, 1939, she's already an opponent of the Nazi regime. She writes quite clearly to her friend Fritz, who was a professional soldier. Now you will have enough to do. I cannot understand that now people are constantly being put in danger of their lives by other people. I can never understand it and I find it appalling. Don't say it's for the fatherland. So you see, she does not distinguish between friend and foe, between Germans, French or Poles. In doing so, it calls into question the whole point of war. If there are no enemies and friends, what is the point in making war? For Sophie's critical attitude toward the Nazi state, her father is very important. He did not manage to stop the children from joining the Hitler Youth. At the time, this was a big conflict in the family. But now the children have realized that Robert Scholl was always right on this point. Sophie lives with her family in Ulm in a niche. Only with the closest friends, you can still talk openly about your fears. After graduating from high school in 1940, Sophie begins training as a kindergarten teacher. And then in 1941, she has to serve at Reich labor service. She's extremely unhappy at that time. You can see it in her diaries and her letters. She hates it to be there. She's physically repulsed by the whole system and just wants to get everything over with as quickly as possible so that she can finally study. But first she has to cope with the fact that the Reichsarbeitsdienst, the Reich Labor Service is extended to 12 months after six months. Furiously, she writes her brother, I will be a, an old woman before I can start to st start my studies. But 
In that time, she also writes, but strangely, only now I feel so rightly that nothing will force me, a wonderful feeling of strength I sometimes have. She starts to study 1942 in Munich. At that time, she knows details about the crimes of the Wehrmacht. She knows about euthanasia program. And the first friend of the Scholl siblings has died in the war. So now she's prepared to work against the Nazis. So let's come to the question, what is exactly Sophie's task in the resistance of the white rose of this famous group of resistance fighters? There are two things for me, which are very important, which I want to tell you. It's the accepted view of historians that in June 1942, Hans Scholl and his friend Alexander Schmorell write four leaflets within a few weeks which they call the, the White Rose Leaflets. Only the two young men write them, duplicate them, and send them out. This work takes place in the cellar of the Schmorell family villa. According to her own statement during the interrogation, Sophie Scholl had nothing to do with these four leaflets. But as early as May, weeks before the first leaflets appeared, Sophie Scholl asked her, fr her friend Fritz for money for a good cause. And she asked him for a stamp on a ration card for a duplicator. This means that she wanted to organize a duplicator before the first leaflets appeared. It also means that if she tried to do so, she must have talked to Hans, her brother, about it. And then they could have also talked about what they could write in such a leaflet. So I cannot prove that Sophie had anything to do with the four leaflets, the first four leaflets, but I will at least point out that it is likely that she knew about them. Perhaps she would have liked to collaborate and was not allowed to because the two men wanted to protect her as a woman. After the distribution of the four first leaflets, Hans and Alex went to go to the front in Russia. And in autumn 1942, Sophie becomes again active on her own. This time she uh, gets the help of Hans Hirzel, the younger brother of a friend of her. She gives him money and he buys a duplicator. So later he will throw this into the river Danube. That's a different story. But Sophie approaches another friend of her father who also promises them to give them money for their actions. And um, she asked her friend Susanne Hirzel for support, which she also assures. So I would like to emphasize, Sophie became active twice on her own initiative. Let us take a look into Sophie's inner life on a very special moment. It is the time before Hans, her brother, returns from the front. Sophie knows that the resistance work now will start again and she will be a part of it. In a letter to Fritz, to her friend who is in Russia. She cannot write about these things, of course, because she does not want to worry Fritz and it would be much too dangerous to tell about this in a letter. But she hints that one has to pay attention to every word one says. And she writes that she feels like, a dro like drowning. She feels like her arms and legs are being pulled down by sinister creatures of the sea with looping arms. She goes on to write that she's often completely paralyzed with fear. And what happens then? And this is so typical for Sophie Scholl. Out of the deep, sad thoughts, Sophie can always connect to her inner strength. And she writes, but no, I don't want to let anything take away my good courage. These trifles will not be able to take over me where I have completely different untouchable joys. When I think of this, strength flows to me and I want to call out a refreshing word to all who are similarly depressed. So the fifth leaflet comes, we call it the fifth leaflet and she has a share. The students start to produce the so-called fifth leaflet. Now there's also the group is not only Hanschall, Alexander Schmorell, 
Sophie joined it, and Willi Graf, Christoph Probst, Professor Kurt Huber. In this leaflet, it is clearly stated that Hitler can never win the war, but only prolong it. And it warns blindly following the Führer to his doom. So it points out the lies that the Nazis are spreading. And there's even a glimpse into the future, which must be shaped European. At the end, it says freedom of speech, freedom of confession, protection of the individual citizen against the arbitrariness of criminal violent states. These are the foundations of the new Europe. This leaflet now is being produced in a very large print run. Imagine this, the first four leaflets had an addition of only 100 copies. And now they are made six to 9,000 copies. This is a really a enormous achievement. And Sophie is actually involved in all phases of this work. She managed the cash register. She helps duplicating. She writes addresses on envelopes. She serves as a courier to Augsburg and Ulm, which is really risky. And then in three nights, Hans and his friends paint slogans on houses in Munich. They write their freedom or down with Hitler or Hitler mass murder. Sophie is not allowed to be presented these actions, although she would like to. Instead, during the day, she puts leaflets in a telephone, in telephone books of telephone booths and on parked cars and in house entrances. She wants to be perceived as an independent thinker that becomes clear. She once writes to Fritz, to her friend, that she might find it unfeminine that she would express herself so strictly politically in her letters. But she then also says that from her point of view, thinking should come first and only then to feelings. The sixth leaflet now is written by Professor Kurt Huber in early February, 1943 under the impression of the defeat of Stalingrad. The group has reproduced this leaflet together and put it into envelopes. On February 18, 1943, Sophie and Hans Scholl, as we have seen in the video, lay out about 3000 copies in the main building of the university. They place it in leaflets on steps, on parapets, in the entrance of lecture halls, there's no one in the corridors. They are alone and they feel safe. And when they are on the second floor, Sophie gives one of the piles a leaflet of leaflets a push. The leaflets rain down in the courtyard. And the, this is the moment the janitor arrives. So this picture of the raining leaflets in this hall, for us nowadays, is a symbol of the white rose. It's a symbol of resistance, although there was just one person who saw this rain, the janitor. And it's at the same moment, it is the moment of the end of the resistance because this is the moment when they are caught. Important to know is that it was not a spontaneous rash action. They had a plan and it nearly worked, but it just nearly. What follows is interrogation, denial first, contradictions, circumstantial evidence. And at the end they had, they did not lang longer deny. They confessed both that they put the leaflets there and they tried to get all the, the, the guilt on themselves. Unfortunately, the interrogation protocol, although it's called protocol, it does not reproduce every spoken sentence but always only summaries. What does become clear, however, is Sophie Scholl proves to be a strong personality in this extremely difficult situation because she takes on as much guilt as possible, wants to have done everything alone with her brother and only with him. Although the Gestapo officer shows her a way out, she could plead that she was dragged into this by her brother and now regrets it. Um, she could ask for mercy and try to present herself as a seduced person who didn't even know exactly what she was doing. But that's exactly what she does do. She takes it all on herself. She insists that she did the right thing and that she would do it again. 
Four, di four days later, we know. Sophie and Hans and Christoph Probst were all sentenced to death and executed the same day. She was 21 years old. So what, what were Sophie's resources? Where did, did she get her power, her strength? Apart from her political attitude, of course, which we already know, there are a lot of things that gave her strength. The most important are the family, love, religion, philosophy, nature, art, music, literature, the love of the family and the cohesion among the Scholl siblings. Of course, her love to Fritz, even the relationship is not very easy. It's a com very complicated one, but gives her much strength because with him, she could be like she was. She didn't have to be strong or uh, pretend anything. So nature is very important for Sophie. She writes it in her diaries and her letters very often that she feels so happy under trees, in the water, in the river, in a, in a lake, um, in the weather, outside. Another thing is art. She painted very beautifully. She was very talented. Um, <clears throat> and she loved, like, <clears throat> for example, the pictures of Paula Modersohn Becker. She writes about it. Um, that art was very important for her, like music. Music, we saw this, this uh, quote uh, in the video, but I want to repeat it. Very quietly and without violence, music opens the doors of the soul. And uh, literature is very important also for Sophie. And this leads to the fundamental question of her life, which she and her friends and siblings ask themselves. How should we live? What are the values? What is the aim of our life? What is the reason? What is the sense? Sophie reads poetry, novels, nonfiction. And religion is a very important resource for her. She's, uh, it gives her on one hand the, the values, the, the ideas of um, people, of, of the worth of life, the worth of mankind. And on the other hand, she has many crises uh, about her, her faith when she says she cannot, uh, she cannot feel close to God. And she's uh, suffering a lot. But then it happens the same thing as I said before. In these deep, sad moments, she said, I just, I just let myself fall and God will hold me, I'm sure. So... It remains that she was able to um, open and use the many treasure chests that she had carried with herself inside and which were a source of strength and difficult times, even in the last days and hours. And I hope that the sadness of this death she was facing, which she did not want at all, was tempered by the feeling of having done the right thing. She knew that she had made a mark in one of the darkest hours of German history. And as we can see from the interest in Sophie Scholl and the White Rose today, this mark shines throughout the world to this day. She's seen by many people as a heroine, and that is not wrong, but she was not a saint. She was a human being. And that is the reason why we can admire her and see her as a role model. She did something that any human being could have done, raise her voice, not resigning herself, showing courage and civil courage, standing up for tolerance, freedom and human, and human dignity. Sophie Scholl could have waited out the end of the war in safety and keep quiet. Would she have? No, she wouldn't have. What unites the members of the White Rose is the fact that they could not continue to watch freedom and human dignity being trampled underfoot in their country. Sophie lived in a dictatorship. She was not allowed to protest loudly. She was not allowed to speak her mind openly. She could not choose between parties or hundreds of different newspapers or broadcasters. That's why there's no similarities between 
Sophie Scholl and a young student we call her in Germany, Jana from Kassel. I do not know if you have heard about her, but she went to a demonstration and said in public, I feel like Sophie Scholl because I stand on demonstrations for months and I um, give away leaflets since weeks. So um, they have nothing in common because Sophie would have liked to live in a democracy like ours. She would have trusted in science and enjoyed democratic structures. She would have enjoyed to, her freedom to speak her mind. Those who compare herself, uh, to, to compare themselves to her in Germany today do not understand history, do not understand Sophie's goals, her resistance or her death. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Mar Man, for this um, really a great uh, insight and in, in a fascinating personality, a strong personality. Um, I'm so glad that you also mentioned Jana at the end and to make clear that uh, uh, these people don't know about history. I completely underline what you what you uh, what you said. Um, so, as I said earlier, we will open up the floor for some questions. So, if you have some, please. Um, write them down in the chat box. Um, so far, I can see no question over there, but um, <laughs> I hope it will start soon. So, of course, I do have some questions. Maybe, Maren, um, we can start with, uh, yeah, with something about uh, Sophie Scholl. Um, she's the most uh, known member of the entire group. Uh, so, why do you think uh, this is the case. So just because she's female or, or what's the reason behind it? I think there are several aspects. Thank you, Melanie, for this question. Uh, one, of course, is she's the only woman in this group of men. This is a very special role, of course. Then the White Rose is already the most known resistance group of German uh, in Germany nowadays. And this is because Ingersoll, the elder sister of Sophie, wrote her book, The White Rose, in 1952. So it was very early when she was telling the story about the White Rose. At that time, the groups like the Red Chapel or the group of Stauffenberg were not accepted as resistance fighters. So this group was very early made known to the people. And as the members of the White Rose, um, besides Professor Huber, the others were so young students. They always had this aura of innocence. So everybody could say, yes, the White Rose is a good group. We have no criticism. Whereas as the Red Chapel was uh, called uh, communistic uh, or the Stauffenberg group was criticized for their plans. But with the White Rose, everybody could um, yeah, everybody could meet, everybody could say, yeah, we are all uh, uh, accept the same uh, situation. And um, then when the films, we have three films about the White Rose. One is already, uh, it's is just no, uh, called Sophie Scholl, The Last Days. And uh, the two other films from 1982, um, are called, one is called The White Rose and one is uh, Five Last Days. And in both films, Sophie Scholl is really in the focus. And Inge Scholl put in her book, which, is, which was a very important work that she wrote this book, The White Rose, but she put Sophie and Hans in the focus. Of course, she was the sister. But since then, all the other members of The White Rose are in the shadow until today. So when I go to schools in my country here in North, North Rhine-Westphalia and I ask the, the pupils, who do you know from the White Rose? They call Sophie and Hans Scholl. They do not know the other names. So that's why I always show the others with pictures and <laughs> call their names. Um, right. Yeah, these are, I think, some of the aspects. Um, and you know, when there are films, when a person is well-known, it gets more and more. It's a, it's a mechanism that you cannot stop. Right. She yeah, deserves. She, she de deserves to, to be so known. 
I want to add this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you you mentioned already the names of the of the other group members, but can you give us some more background information yeah. about them? Yes, Alexander Schmorell, who was uh, with Hans Scholl, uh, the author of the first four leaflets, uh, was also a student of medicine like Hans Scholl, and he had a Russian mother. So he was very unhappy when they had to go to the front to Russia and they were discussing what they would do if uh, they would um, uh, meet with Russian people uh, or, or with an enemy. And he said he would never shoot uh, on, on a Russian uh, soldier because they were his people. And uh, the others uh, saw this different, of course. Um, and he was a uh, uh, he was a uh, very uh, fond of art too. He was uh, painting and he was uh, uh, working with sculpturing. Sculpturing. He uh, fled after the um, after Sophie and and Hans were in prison. Uh, Alexander Schmorell uh, fled uh, and uh, was underground, and um, he was uh, betrayed uh, by somebody who, who recognized him. And then he was also sentenced to death. Then Willy Graf uh, was a young man from Saarbrücken. He came from the Catholic uh, youth uh, movement. He was the only one of the group who was never in the Hitler Youth. So, so there were very few people managed not to join this group, even after 1937, when it was uh, obligatory to enter. But he managed to do not to do it. And um, He was, uh, he was, uh, yeah, he came from a Catholic um, family. Uh, he was uh, part of the Bach Choir in Choir, you say Bach Choir? Yeah, Choir. Mm -hmm. In Munich. And uh, he, they, they, they all, uh, they, all the members of the White Rose were so much involved in music and art and theater and all these things. Um, and there was uh, Christoph Probst, It was a, he was an old school friend from Alexander Schmorell. He was the only one of the young people who was already married and had three little children. So the group always said, we have to, we have to see that Christoph is not involved in any risky actions because he has a family. Yeah. And it was so tragic that Hans Scholl, when he was um, um, arrested, noticed and it must must have been a horror moment for him that he had a handwritten paper of Christoph Probst uh, in his in his coat in his uh, uh, yeah in his jacket so he tried to uh, to, to tear it into pieces it and I think he tried to swallow some of the pieces but uh, the pieces were um, uh, were found and um, so this was maybe the ground, uh, the cause for that Christoph Post was, was uh, arrested too. Maybe the Gestapo would not have come to Christoph Probst because he uh, belonged to a different company and didn't yeah. live in Munich like the others. And so I think yeah. for the family, it's uh, until today uh, uh, a horrible wound. And Professor Huber, I'm sorry, yeah. don't forget him. Professor Huber was a uh, philosophy uh, prof professor in Munich who, um, who was a member of the party, of the Nationalist uh, Party, in fact. But um, with the war, he turned into an enemy of the, of the Nazis. But um, he fulfilled his, uh, his job, he gave his lectures, and he must have done this very, 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 very intelligent because The, the White Rose students loved his lectures because they could feel his, uh, um, his subtle, sub, uh, sub, uh, subtle texts, sub, uh, how do you say it? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. text, subtext, yeah. <laughs> He, they could understand his criticism of the, uh, of the Nazis, but there were other professors um, who sent their students like uh, as spies to the lectures of Professor Huber and said, if he says something, he, he mustn't say, tell us at once so we can uh, chase him out of the university, but they found nothing. So he must have done this very, very intelligent. Yeah. 
Thank you, Marin. There are uh, lots of questions about anti-Semitism, not about uh, anti-Semitism today, but um, also uh, maybe back uh, during during uh, during uh, the the Nazi regime, and um, also to um, uh, what happened to Sophie if she experienced anti-Semitism, if she had some Jewish uh, friends, and so on. Do you yeah. know anything about that before we come to the yes. more uh, current? Uh, problems yeah. <laughs> yes it's um yeah the problem uh it, it, there's it's really not very easy to talk about this because we do not know much about that um uh, inge Scholl, the sister of sophie always told the story that sophie was angry that her jewish uh, friends uh, were not allowed to share um to, to join the hitler youth and we historians were not really sure if this story was true because she called one of the Jewish um, friends of Sophie, um, Louisa Nathan. And uh, I talked to the daughter of Louisa Nathan and she told me um, my mother never said that she was feeling like a friend of Sophie. They were not friends. And Inge was always telling about the blonde haired, blue eyed Louisa Nathan, and she was not at all like that. <laughs> so I thought, oh, I, maybe this story is not true. But then I found in the USA, uh, Anneliese Dortzbeck, who was another Jewish um, uh, friend of Sophie, she was called then um, Anneliese Wallersteiner. And I was talked, I had a long talk with her, uh, several talks on the phone, and she, um she told me yes she was angry and she told she told us if we are if you are not allowed to join in the hitler youth then we shall make our own club so we make our own fancy hats like with crouch crouch i think as you call this crouching it was your it's not knitting it's crouching we have just one needle with a hook yeah. so uh, crochet uh, they made the little hats. Of course, they were not allowed to go with these hats into the school. But uh, Anneliese uh, told me that Sophie was a very um, warm-hearted friend of her and that she didn't understand or didn't accept that her friends were not allowed to join the Hitler Youth, which is, from our point of view, of course, crazy. <laughs> uh, but it, it's, it shows that people didn't know sometimes that it was a really political uh, institution, of course. The young people thought it's just for, for, for the afternoon, for the fun. So um, we do not know much more about that. She uh, does not write about the theme, um, the Jewish uh, people, the, the, the pupils who have lost this, uh, left the school. We know that her father had Jewish uh, clients and uh, they uh, so, um, reported after the war also that he helped many of them. He tried to support, he tried to help them to leave the country, to take the money out of the country. Amelie Fried is a quite famous uh, German author. Her uh, grandfather, I think, had a, um, had a shoe uh, fabric or shoe shop. And uh, this family also is, uh, um, he, he, her grandfather said, this Mr. Scholl is a good man and he really helped us. And I know that the family of the Hartnagel, which is uh, the, the family of the Scholl's uh, nephews are still in contact with the Jewish family be, uh, of the Einsteins, not the Einstein, not, not, uh, not this Einstein. Um, who uh, who say who say uh, um, that Mr. Scholl helped them a lot, and so they they are a good connection. So mm -hmm. I, from that point of view, I think it's not it's not possible that Sophie uh, was anti-Semitic anti -Semitic, uh, thinking, but mm -hmm. we do not really know much about that. This mm -hmm. is a problem of research. So if you if you say we don't know so much about that, uh, maybe you can just help us with another question, which came also over the chat, um, via the chat. Um, so if Sophie would be with us uh, today and would experience all this, you know, social media hate and so on, um, what would she fight for? What, what do you think? Yeah, for me as a historian, this is a very difficult question because as a historian, I cannot answer that. I cannot 
uh, Sophie didn't know our world. So I cannot take her for our modern problems. What I can do is to think what were her values, what were her, the things she was fighting for, and to say that this tolerance and this is uh, um, being good to human, that this life is uh, uh, to be saved, nature is to be saved, I can say this. But I cannot say she would have been nowadays with Fridays for Future or the BOND or any other or the Green Party or something like that. I cannot say that. Mm -hmm. Just privately, just privately, <laughs> not as a historian. Um, I sometimes think if she had survived the war, I could imagine that I, I'd like to imagine that she could have been one of the mothers of our Grundgesetz, of our. Um, What is the Grundgesetz? I'm sorry. Uh, Constitution. The Constitution. I'm sorry. I'm I'm very sorry for my. All oh, good. <laughs> It's light here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But this is yeah. not. I cannot say this as a historian, of course. Yeah. There was also a question, um, but maybe you can you can answer on that too. To me, um, so what is being done in universities and high schools today to keep the memories of these brave freedom uh, fighters alive? So um, maybe I can just uh, tell a little bit about my work. Um, so because I'm I'm also writing uh, school textbooks, as I said earlier, and and work. Uh, for uh, publishing houses here in German speaking countries. And of course I try to uh, bring, into, um, bring into the story of the White Rose into the books. I mean, it's already there, but we, we have uh, not the latest textbooks here. So uh, from time to time, we need to, to write some new parts in it and so on. And, um, and so of course, this is, a, this is an, import, uh, an important uh, topic. Although, as I said earlier, Uh, we don't have so much time in history classes, especially in history classes in Germany. So um, to to bring into all these stories, of course, uh, there's a lot of interest, as you said all, uh, already, we have lots of streets uh, named by the Geschwister Scholl and so on. And uh, so it's pretty, uh, they are very well known, but uh, still we, We really don't know from a from a researcher's point of view. We really don't know what's going on in class in the classroom um, when it comes to these stories, right? And uh, of course, we can put it into the into the textbooks and so on. And as I know, as far as I know, you give lectures too. And um, so, how do you reach this uh, school kids and 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 maybe our uh, maybe maybe students at the universities? From my point of view, schools really try to do a lot. Uh, to to make this story known, the they have understood understood that you can tell history very good with if you tell the story of human beings. This is easier to understand history if you have pictures of people and and uh, uh, you can identify with. So. Um, that the schools really try to do everything that people have the possibility to understand what happened uh, in, the, in the Second World War and in the Nazi time. The problem from my point of view is that they have not enough time for that, as you said at the beginning. With the, uh, all the reforms of our schools, history is one of the subjects uh, where they have really cut uh, the curriculum. And so, um, and the nine, I think it's the ninth form when they start with the Nazi time. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, they're very happy when I'm coming to this to the school because then they know she's already explaining something. And um, I, I see, I see the young people. I have, uh, they are normally 15, 16, uh, and I, I, I think they are touched by the story of Sophie Scholl. And so via this story, we can make clear what was the kind of the um, society at that time, because frankly, some of the young people, they do not know the difference between the Nazi time and the DDR, the, the uh, communist. DDR. They, yeah, DDR, because they think, it was, was it not both uh, with uh, uh, no, no free, freedom of speech? And the, the things get mixed because right. it's all far away from them. And um, so 
I, I think the books are good, the teachers are good. Uh, they need more time uh, to, to talk with the people uh, about that. And um, if you, I don't know if you know the Instagram uh, channel, Ich bin Sophie Scholl, which is a new, very new, very modern uh, approach, uh, approach to tell the story. It is criticized, of course, because everything is criticized, <laughs> which is new. <laughs> Uh, that's okay, but it's discussed a lot, which is fine. And and I meet um, uh, many uh, pupils tell tell me I like uh, the channel very much because it's uh, it's uh, Niederschwellig. I do not know the word. I'm sorry. What you say that Niederschwellig? Yeah, there's easy access to that. Yeah, easy um, access. Put it that you. way. Yeah. yeah, you can just follow uh, Sophie Scholl uh, for the last for the time she's in Munich. And um, so maybe we have to uh, get more ideas what we can do to, uh, there, there are other Instagram uh, uh, channels uh, telling, uh, Anne Frank also is, uh, is uh, mm. story is told at uh, uh, Instagram. I think is uh, to, to, to say, we, we want to still tell the story, the history there where the people are. It's a good, it's a good idea, right. of course. Yeah. Yeah, there's also a question um, from the audience that's maybe uh, maybe close to that. How do you think the telling of the story of Sophie has changed in Germany in the last decades? You mentioned already the, the modern approach like Instagram and so on. So, but from a more historiographical standpoint, how did it change over the years? Uh, it's it changed because we can see the. Um... Uh, the diaries and the letters of her. Uh, at, uh, until um, Ingersoll has died, nobody, no historian could see any original paper of her. So we had just the version of Ingersoll. And Ingersoll tried to explain Sophie a bit like, uh, yeah, a brave little girl. <laughs> Uh, was strong, but um, she, for example, she uh, she said, yeah, with the Hitler youth, she was not so really so deeply involved. And now, as we see her diaries and her letters, we can see, yes, she she was involved, and she was uh, she was uh, uh, convinced about this the system at that time. So we can see Sophie um, with more critical, complicated character, uh, her, her character better. And I think this is what we are doing all the time. All the, the biographers uh, try to, to make clear that we have not a saint, but we have a human being and which was not very easy to cope with. If you, if you see Sophie and her friend Fritz and to read the letters with, um, of them, sometimes I thought, well, poor Fritz is <laughs> trying to, to make everything right, but it's... It's never, it's never enough. So she was not easy. And maybe this is because maybe people who are resistance fighters are like that. They are not easy. They don't make compromise. Mm -hmm. they, they want to discuss uh, uh, the things. So yeah. this was the question was, yeah, I think it yeah, changed. Yeah. You yeah, see her now change. clearly, more clearly, more... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. And um, during during her lifetime or within the last month or so, um, did people um, really mention her or did they know? Do we know anything about how they uh, did they know anything about the White Rose during her lifetime? Or is it more like looking backwards and that's why she seems to be like a saint and so on? What you mentioned at the very beginning. It's a good question. Um, if you if you imagine that the first leaflets were were duplicated a hundred times, a hundred uh, copies, and a third of the people went directly to the police with the with the leaflet. So they sent the leaflets to to people they didn't know, people who were teachers, professors, doctors, priests, people who they thought could multiplicate their ideas and a third of them went directly to the police so they did not reach so many people as they thought and mm -hmm. the fifth and the sixth leaflet while well, the fifth was really spread in several cities which was a very clever idea of the white rose because 
people, um, the Gestapo at least thought, oh, it's a big network now because they are already in, in different cities. People who received the leaflets, of course, they didn't know that. So it's difficult to say what um, did they reach the people of how many, how, how did people react who received these leaflets? Many of them were panicked because they thought, is it a yeah. trap? And some, of course, tried to uh, go on with this work, like the people in Hamburg at the university. Uh, we have this branch of the White Rose in Hamburg, uh, where some young people also tried to, uh, to, to, to spread the leaflets. But of course, during the lifetime, nobody knew that who was behind the leaflets, because nobody knew their names. They were anonymous, uh, anonymous uh, leaflets. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they would have been in concentration camp directly. So, yeah. uh, but Sophie was, people were impressed by her. Her friends, uh, I think uh, you can say that, that uh, they, they learned that she was a, she, sometimes she, she was very strict or very, Mm, as, as if she was very had had a lot of humor, but sometimes people really she, she had to get um, close to the people before she showed this side. Otherwise, she was more like uh, not saying a lot, not saying much. If she was in a big group, just mm -hmm. when they, she was with a smaller group, she was opener. So um, very thankful girl. People thought she thinks a lot, talks not much. But of course, she was fa not famous. She's, she started to be famous many years after her death. Yeah, yeah. There's also another question um, about Sophie Scholl and Anne Frank, uh, which is quite interesting um, to make this connection. <laughs> Do you see any parallels, anything, you know, like, like uh, or non-parallels between them? I mean, it's a totally uh, the only parallel. Uh, the only thing that they have in common that they are both young women which are very famous because, and this is maybe a little bit more uh, they have in common. They were both very intelligent and they could write, they could express their feelings, their thoughts so well. So that the diary of Anne Frank is a very impressive uh, book. And the diaries of Sophie, there were even less, maybe less intellectual than Anne Frank's. Uh, maybe Sophie wrote more about her problems and the, she didn't wrote, write so much, of course. Her diaries is shorter. We have not a book of her diary. It's not an edition. It's all in the, uh, in the Institute of Zeitgeschichte in, in Munich. So mm -hmm. you cannot buy it. You can just read passages in, in the biographies. And uh, so she didn't write a book like uh, Anne Frank did, uh, really very constantly. Sophie sometimes writes, and then she took out the pages and she ma made everything black. And <laughs> it's very wild, uh, her diaries. Uh, but we can get very close to them because they were both uh, trying to express themselves very... Um, fine, very, um, uh, I missed the word, very exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and this is maybe what they have in common, even their, their, their story, of course, is yeah. their life is completely different. Yeah, true. Yeah. I need to come back to anti-Semitism because uh, most of the mm -hmm. questions uh, that reached me uh, are around this topic. So would you think, I mean, you mentioned already that we are not clear about her, her view on, on Judaism and anti-Semitism anti and so on. Do you think we could use the story of uh, Sophie and, and all the others uh, to fight anti-Semitism today in a way or to, to, use, uh, yeah, to use the story of the White Rose uh, to, to, uh, yeah, to say something, to say something against all this hatred yes. in the internet, social media and so on? Yeah. And yes, of so course. <laughs> yes, of course, because the White Rose is concerning nowadays research, the only group which uh, condemned the behavior of the Nazis against the Jews in their leaflets. 
-hmm. No other resistance group did that. Mm -hmm. So these, these passages of the fourth leaflet are very important. Of course, there was a time when some um, historians tried to turn this against the white rose to say there were anti-Semitism in, in the white rose because, um, because of their uh, formulation, because of their kind of uh, arguing, um, because they said something like, do you want to uh, have the same fate like the Jews had or something like that? So you, there are some sentences you can, if you take them out of the context, you can understand them very wrong. But it's, uh, what is clear is that they condemn the Verbrechen, uh, the, the murder of the Jews uh, in Poland. They, they say this directly in the, in the fourth leaflet. Mm -hmm. And um, you have to keep in mind that the, the White Rose knew that the people they were addressing, the people they were sending their leaflets to, they thought, or they must have, they must have known that maybe there were anti-Semitism. So they thought, um, they argued in different, on different uh, levels. And um, they said, uh, we do not want to discuss the question of the Jewish people here, uh -huh. which is, which some people interpreted as uh, anti-Semitistic. But what they, I think what they wanted to say is, we will not discuss this theme here, but of course, it is a crime that so that the 500,000 uh, Jews in, in Poland were killed. Isn't, isn't that horrible? Isn't that, no, this is inc incredible. This is un, uh, um, so th they made it very clear that, uh, uh, that this is a crime and they see it like this. Okay, so I think uh, there are no questions left here. And um, Maren, thank you so much for this uh, yeah, fascinating insights uh, you gave us tonight and uh, or this afternoon, I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, we are almost on time. So um, lots of Germans here, obviously. <laughs> and uh, so we managed this uh, 90 minutes uh, 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 limit. Um, Thank you very much. Also, uh, thank you very much to the German embassy and uh, to the um, uh, to the friends of uh, uh, Simon Wiesenthal Center to make this um, make this possible today. So I think it was very uh, interesting, and uh, we got lots of information and and um, uh, yeah, lots of things uh, to think about actually and take uh, home with. And it was a great. It was a great event. So thank you all very much for attending. And um, I say good night from Hamburg and uh, hope to see you somewhere uh, soon. So good night. Thanks, Maren. Thank you.